Pastor Andre Marley knelt before the altar, praying to God for a bountiful harvest. Lord, give me the strength to do what must be done, and the serenity to know when the time to strike comes. Protect me as I go about your works, and bring me safely back home again. Amen. Pastor Marley knew it was blasphemy, but he pressed his lips to the rosary before sliding it back into his pocket and moving to the rectory to get his tools. It was time to go to work. Pastor Andre Marley, once Father Andre Marley, had been a member of the Catholic Church since he was 17. He had taken his vows, been vested and consecrated, and had taken to church life well. He had a parish in northern Europe, a little town on the French border, and that had been his first encounter with true evil. Marley went to his knees beside his bed, as he had done a thousand times before, but reached beneath as he pulled out an unfinished wooden box. He had left the church, become a lapsed Catholic, but he couldn't bring himself to be rid of the trappings of his former life. The box was where he kept his robes, his collar, his tools of destruction. He placed the box on the bed, sliding out the robes and vestments as he made ready to do the Lord's work. He brought the robes to his nose, inhaling the smell of another life. Rose oil, sage, the oils he had anointed so many with, and the subtle smell of the host as it rose. He had loved his parish, and the parishioners had loved him as well. He had been a pillar of the community, the glue that so often held them together, but it hadn't stopped the incursion of evil in the end. It had been subtle at first. They had hidden in the places where the weakest and most easily corrupted hid, and by the time they moved on to those who might be missed, it was too late. Marley had tried to save them, tried to keep them away from the church, but in the end, he had failed and been forced into exile. The church had not ostracized him. They had celebrated his work and told him that he had fought against evil as hard as any of them, but Marley had known better. He had gotten lax in his efforts, or so he believed, and his flock had paid the price. He had cast himself out and gone as far from the influence of the green man as he could. The robes still fit, and he slid the holy water and the vessel for the host into his pocket before sliding the familiar stole around his neck. It had been a long time since he'd worn them, fifteen years at least, but they fit just the same. It always made him feel powerful to wear the vestment of his faith, and if he died tonight, he hoped he would lay forever in them, wherever it was that he fell. He walked out of the rectory, sliding his hands along the smooth walls of the church for what could be the last time. The church had been his home for the last five years, and it was one of the best houses of God that he had found himself in since his conversion. He had wallowed in his exile for quite some time when he had first left the faith, and going amongst the Protestants had seemed a fitting punishment for his transgressions. What he had found, however, was that they really weren't so different than his Catholic brothers. Some were good, some were bad, but they all held to their faith fiercely and clung to it tightest in times of need. As he went into the garage and slid behind the wheel of his Ford Ranger, he hoped he would see this place again, though he felt a aching knowledge in his guts that he wouldn't be back here. He hadn't been able to fight the green man when he was younger, but he could fight him now. He would be damned if he let the town fall to the false prophet, and by the end of the evening, Marley would know whether damnation was something that was in the cards for him or not. This idea seems less advisable the longer we go on about it, Gibbs said as the two of them stalked through the woods at dusk. Then go back if that's what you want, Travis said, keeping low as he tried to keep the limbs from grabbing at him. Shoot, just because it's a bad idea doesn't mean I'm not going to see it through. 
They'd come to the end of the road just before sunset and had parked the cruiser a little way down so they could walk up. Badges or not, it seemed like a bad idea to just head up to a place where you suspected they might be hosting a gathering of hellions and start trying to arrest people. As they came up through the woods, they crouched more than once as headlights passed by. People were heading towards whatever it was that was at the end of the access road, and Travis meant to find out if it was the group that he had been looking for. What are we going to do once we get there? Gibbs asked, the setting sun making the slight glow on the horizon all the more ominous. Something was brewing up the way, and Travis was afraid of what they might be seeking. I guess we'll call it in, he said. Guess if we can get Gage and Dreyfus up here, we can start making some arrests. If we call Sheriff Carl, he might even wake up everyone and get the full brunt of the police force down here to round everybody up. Gibbs nodded, the logic pretty sound, but Travis knew tonight would be mostly recon. Tonight would be a lot of writing down tag numbers and studying faces from the tree line so that they could ambush people in the light and get some answers. Tonight would be about escaping with their knowledge so they could unravel this case away from the danger of a group of hellions. You hear that? Gibbs whispered, pricking his ears like a dog who's hurt a rabbit. Travis listened, and finally he picked it out from the sound of frogs and crickets. It was the talk, talk, talk of hard heels on rock. Get low, Travis whispered, both of them crouching in the scraggy trees. Gibbs had his gun out, something Travis hadn't quite dared, and as the footsteps came up the road, he saw the silhouette of a man in long robes. He was walking determinedly up the center of the road, his hands shoved into his pockets, and as he passed them, Travis got a good look at his face in the rich, dying light of the day. Is that... is that Pastor Marley? Travis Stage whispered as the man moved up the road and clear of earshot. Looked like. Where do you think he's heading? Travis watched as the black-robed man made his way up the road, nearly invisible amidst the dying light. Same place we're going, it looks like. Come on, he might need help. They went a little quicker now, their recon possibly turning into a backup operation. Wherever the preacher was going, he looked ready for a fight, and Travis hoped he was ready for whatever was waiting for him up ahead. Marley had parked his car near the end of the road and sat behind the wheel preparing for a few minutes. He prayed again for strength, for peace, for the serenity to use the gifts God might give him. This could be the end of him, he knew that, but doing nothing would be the end of his faith, and that was unacceptable. He'd given up his faith once, he was not in such a hurry to cast it aside again. The police had become aware of the pumpkin boy less than a week ago, but Marley had been keeping tabs on him for closer to two. It had all begun when Mrs. Cortez, one of his parishioners who had come to him with concerns about her grandson, Mrs. Cortez, like him, was a lapsed Catholic who had found a home with the local Baptists. Her grandson, David, had fallen in with a bad crowd, and when she had said as much to Marley, he had laughed without meaning to. <laughs> in Frasier, I can't see a gang hiding much here. Well, not a gang per se, she said, seeming unsure. He leaves in the night when he thinks everyone's asleep and comes back early the next morning. David, the boy in question, was eleven, and Marley thought it unlikely he was simply going out into the night. Is this the same David that needed to be picked up early from the retreat two years ago because he was afraid of the dark? Miss Cortez had furrowed her brow, believing she was being mocked, and Marley softened as he changed gears. I'm sorry, Miss Cortez. I didn't mean to make light of your situation. I'll say a prayer for him, and unless you'd like me to speak with him... I'm not sure he'd take an old preacher any more seriously than his own grandmother, but I will try. Would you? she said, brightening. It might make a world of difference. 
I just don't want him to get mixed up in something that will end badly for him. It's why I sent his mother to live with her sister so she wouldn't fall in with a bad crowd. I'd hate for my grandson to make the mistake that I took out of his mother's path. Marley had said he would, but what he found when he went to the park to speak with David was far worse. His grandmother had told Marley that David liked to hang out with his friends after school at Rutherford Park, but when he went to wait for him, he saw another group approaching the hedge, and that was his first glimpse of the strange pumpkin child. At first he had worried that the group of much bigger boys meant to hurt him, the child with the pumpkin on his head being much smaller than they were. But when they showed the boy deference, bending to speak with him in respect, he watched the group step into the hedge and disappear from view. That was the start of his surveillance, but it certainly wasn't the end. Pastor Marley felt the clock of his heels on the hard stone and the firm smack of souls gave him confidence. It was the stability that he'd been looking for, and he had missed it in the years that had passed when the missionaries and the speakers for the green men had invaded his town. He had ignored them. They were just travelers, passing through and speaking of strange ideas. But he wouldn't let them pass this time. He would save this town, the way he hadn't saved his first flock, and atone for the sins of his past. He had watched the hedge for the next few days, keeping an eye peeled for more activity. He couldn't have explained why, but he knew there was something strange going on. This whole thing seemed off, and Marley wanted to know why. He kind of thought it might be drugs at first. This was the farm belt, after all, and meth wasn't out of the question. Like Miss Cortez, he thought some gang from a nearby town had set up shop and was using the impressionable kids to do their dirty work. He went right on thinking that, until the graffiti started appearing. Marley had been walking home from the corner store when he'd seen the green and orange missive scrawled across the front of the old warehouse where the kids sometimes played stickball. All how the green man, it had said, the letters runny and barely legible. Anyone else would have passed it off as simple tagging, but Pastor Marley hadn't even noticed when the bags in his hands had landed on the ground. His eggs had smashed, his creamer leaking out impotently, but he could do nothing but stand and stare. It was like seeing an old enemy across the years and miles and knowing a dread you hadn't felt since you were young. The green man was here now, and Marley was afraid that it might already be too late. The road ended abruptly, his confident heels sinking into the dirt of a country road, but it didn't slow the priest in the least bit. He could see some kind of rude structure ahead, and within it were gathered a collective of adults and children. They were holding torches, the bonfire behind the pavilion making the angles look almost natural. They were standing in an open-air hall, a raised dais letting them all hear what the little pumpkin kid had to say as he presided over them. The bonfire cast his shadow long across the ground, and as Marley came to the edge of the gathering, he felt the eyes of the child rest on him. No, not the kid's eyes. It was the eyes of the adversary. Beyond the bonfire was a blasphemous altar made of stone and odd geometry, it looked as if it had fallen from the heavens fully formed, and no hand had wrought such a thing as that. Within it was a small opening, like a viewing port for some terrible diorama, and Father Marley felt certain that this was where the heart of evil lay. This was the house where the enemy resided, and the taint would persist until it was closed. This was his target, but suddenly he felt more eyes than those of the enemy upon him. The pumpkin child's congregation had turned to look at him, and he felt his strength desert him for half a second. He was no Samson, no David, and he could not hope to fight all of them. Much like Samson, however, Marley thought that he could pull the temple down upon himself, if such was required. I have come to put an end to your corruption of my town, 
and I will not stop until the green man is no more, he stated into the silence. Jesus, Gibbs breathed, watching the crowd shuffle in the wake of the priest's condemnation. He's got stones, I'll give him that. Yeah, but I think he may be about to lose them, Travis responded. That crowd's fifty deep at the least. Few more than Nathan told us about. A couple of them are bigger than the little kids we came looking for, too. I'll say. Are those the phys ed's teachers from the high school? And that's Fred Masters from the hardware as well. Jupiter from the fill and go and... Holy shit! He breathed. But Travis had already seen them. They had come in uniform, for God's sake. And the sight of Gage and Dreyfus complicated things some. Did the sheriff know they were here? Surely he wasn't involved in this too, or why would he have them investigate at all? No, Travis had to believe that Sheriff Carl wasn't wrapped up in this. Otherwise, the implications were that he wanted both of them gone, and Travis refused to believe it. They were standing at the edge of the woods, watching the priest as he squared off against the gathered throngs. What do we do now? asked Gibbs, and Travis could hear the rattle of his weapon. You need to go back and tell the sheriff what we've seen. I'll keep an eye on the preach and make sure he doesn't bite off more than he can chew. Not a chance in hell, Gibbs said. I'm not even sure the two of us can help the old preacher, let alone just you. Yeah, and when we both get our fool selves killed, then who's going to tell him what's going on out here? Gibbs smirked, shaking his head. Nah, you ain't getting rid of me that easy. Come on, partner. Let's go help the preach before he gets himself killed. Travis wanted to rail at him, but he couldn't help but admire the man's courage. He wasn't sure that he'd be able to pass up an offer like that if it had come his way. Between them, they had about 24 rounds, and Travis was pretty sure there were at least twice that many on the pavilion. What's more, if his old pals still had their guns, then things could get messy. Gage was a better shot than Travis, and Dreyfus had been on the pistol team when he worked at the prison in Ledford. At the end of the day, he supposed it didn't really matter, though. Protect and serve and all that. Come on, Travis said, drawing his own gun. Let's get this over with. The kid with the jack-o'-lantern on his head had been talking about burning down the barn at the stutter farm. Something about getting the last of the pumpkins before they moved on to the town. But he stopped talking when he saw the priest come into view. Was that fear Marley saw? Or simply curiosity? It was hard to tell through the pumpkin head. And the closer he got to the dais, the more he began to doubt it was either. The closer he got, the more Marley came to doubt that whatever lay between that gourd could express much of anything. And the image gave him a shudder. In the name of God, I demand that you cease this communion with Satan. You've been swayed by evil, and I mean to see it brought to an end. Father Marley had expected derision, perhaps scorn, but the gathered masses were deadly quiet. They turned to the child in eerie cohesion, and the boy looked back at him with wooden interest. The pumpkin boy was younger than Marley had at first guessed, and being this close made him think the kid might be even younger than that. He was small, seven or eight perhaps, but his childish hands moved masses, it seems. The hollow eyes of the pumpkin regarded him evenly, and Marley once again felt sure that they were hollow. We have no truck with your interloper, priest, said the pumpkin child, his cherubic voice sounding steady as he spoke from the dais. No more than we have with your lamb god, Depart our company and cease your attempts to thwart the coming of winter, and we will allow you to leave in peace. For now. Marley wasn't set back in the least, and as he walked amongst the parted flock of this pumpkin child, he felt like David amongst the lions. Of course he would say that he wasn't a tool of Satan. Few who served that imp said as much, and the interloper was present in many works. The idea that this green man might be something beyond his kin never occurred to him. In that moment, Father Marley was doing the Lord's work, and he meant to see it completed. Repent, child. It isn't too late. You have a demon in you, 
a demon that has infected these that you've gathered here as well. Repent and cast it aside, and I will sunder it from you. There was no smirking contempt or lashing challenge from the child, only nodding assuredness. You may find, priest, that there are more things than heaven and hell in the wide world, though it may be too late once you learn them. The crowd began to circle him as he prayed, but the priest had known they would. He was prepared to die for his endeavors, knowing full well that it would be better than the alternative. He had run from them before, run from his church as the devil came to him, and that had been his reason for leaving. As he hid in the forests that surrounded the town, praying for deliverance and hearing his parishioners scream in agony, he had felt the disapproval of his God. These Protestants may speak of God's love and forgiveness, but many of them had forgotten about God's wrath. God was still that vengeful entity that had burned Sodom and Gomorrah, that had told Abraham to sacrifice his child, who had burned Job's home and lands to the ground just to prove a point. And as Marley knelt in the woods, he felt certain that God would have loved nothing more than to strike him dead right there. Fortunately for him, God had plans for him, and now it was time for Marley to make good on those plans. If those plans were for him to die in martyrdom, it would still be better than watching another flock perish beneath the green man's brutality. He closed his eyes, reciting the Lord's Prayer, leading into the passages that would glorify God and humble the demons who resided here. He could feel the press of heat as they moved around him and lifted his voice as he worked into a fervor. He would cleanse these people with his dying breath if he must, and when the gunshot erupted, Marley waited for the burn. The burn never came, but the press shifted a little as some of the crowd turned to regard the shooter. That's enough, said a familiar voice, and Marley opened his eyes to see Officer Parks approaching with his gun leading the way. Officer Gibbs was close behind him, barrel wavering as he seemed unsure where to point it. I don't know what the hell you're doing out here, and I don't really care. We're leaving with Pastor Marley. Anyone who gets in my way is going to jail for obstruction. That's a promise. Now disperse. The mob was in his way. Two of them officers from the night shift. Marley was disappointed to see, and they showed no signs of compliance. Marley turned his head back to the pumpkin kid, directing his words to the embodiment of the interloper. The child seemed unaffected by those words, staring at him through hollow eyes, and Marley lifted his voice as another gunshot rang out. Whatever was going on behind him was irrelevant. The real battle was between he and the pumpkin head. Another shot went off. Something sprayed across the back of Marley's neck, and there was a wet sound like stone hitting meat. Someone had gone down, and Marley pulled the holy water from his pocket as he prayed one of his protectors hadn't been hurt. The water arced from the mouth of the bottle, dappling across the orange face of the pumpkin, and Marley finished his convictions as he waited for the coming hiss. He expected pain, convulsions, the wail of a spirit touched by God's judgment. But as the boy tilted his head as if to ask if that was all, Father Marley realized that he may have erred. As I told you, priest, there is none of your devil here. Your God has no power over me or the master I serve. We are beyond you. We are strange, and your lamb God has no power within strange. Something flared to life behind the boy, and Marley realized, possibly too late, that his attention may have been on the wrong idol. The stone edifice behind him had begun to pulsate with a sickening red light. The small square in the center, the heart of the construct, was blinking like a caution light, and the longer Marley watched, the more he believed that something was rising from that light. It came galloping from the depths, growing larger with each passing moment, and when Marley was bumped unceremoniously to the side, he saw that he was not the only one who had taken notice. The crowd was coming back, their faces rapturous, as they watched whatever this was come into the world. It is time, the pumpkin child said, raising his hand skyward as he invited them to witness. The coming of the winter lord is upon us. 
the green man comes. He comes. He comes. He comes, they chanted. As the rider burst from the stone square, growing as he landed on this side of the void, Father Marley was filled with a terrible knowledge. The child had been right. This creature was older than anything he knew, stranger than anything beneath the sun or moon, and as he tried to flee, his escape was halted. He briefly caught a glimpse of one of the officers crumpled on the ground, but the other was nowhere to be found. He briefly caught a glimpse of the road that would have taken him back to his car if he could but find it. He would never see his car, his church, or anything comforting again. And as they spun him around, he came face to face with the green apparition that he had been right to run from so many years ago. He was mounted on a black horse, sleek and skeletal, and when he turned his armored head towards the priest, he was struck dumb by the power exuded from him. I have come, said the green man, his voice like an avalanche from the coldest peak, and the doom of worlds comes with me. Travis ran through the forest. He didn't know where he was going, but anything was better than what he was leaving behind. The front of his shirt was turning red, the wound on his stomach making him wince. But if he had any hope of keeping the rest of his blood where it belonged, he had to get away from here. He hadn't really thought they would attack them. They were their neighbors, their friends, and he had hoped that being found in such a compromising situation would shame some of them into leaving. When he and Gibbs had broken cover, Travis fired a single shot in the air to give the preacher time to run. He had hoped some of them would cut and run as well. Instead, they had been forced to shoot a few of them before whatever that thing had been came out of the weird stone box. They had killed Gibbs, at least Travis thought they had, and when one of them had slid a knife into his guts, Travis thought it would be the end of him too. Gibbs had shot Drafus, the man reaching for his piece, but somehow the mob had gotten in behind them. Travis had heard his partner gurgle as someone slid a knife into the side of his neck, but he had barely brought the gun up to bear when a sharp pain had erupted in his stomach. He found Gabriel Tanner, someone he'd gone to high school with, grinning like a lunatic as he pulled the knife free, and when the man lifted it to deal him a killing blow, Travis thought that'd be the end of him. That's when they all turned, the pumpkin kid yelling about something, and he had been left on the ground to bleed. He'd gotten to his feet and run then, adrenaline still pumping, but as it began to ebb and the wood stretched out before him, he felt sure that he wouldn't make it out alive. When a root caught his foot and he went down in a sprawl on the forest floor, he thought this would be where he'd die. He was just starting to black out when a crunch of leaves brought him back to reality. Great, he thought. What fresh hell was this? There he is! I told you I saw him run in this direction. Travis turned his head and thought he was seeing double for a minute. There were two pumpkin heads now, one big and one small, and they were both standing over him, looking down with their questioning triangle eyes. The difference between them and the one he'd seen in the pavilion, however, were that these two clearly had heads beneath. As he passed out, Travis wondered what he had been discovered by and whether he would wake up on this side of the veil or the other. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's video. If you still feel like you could do with a little more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that's appearing on your screen? If you're not subscribed, why not go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss any of the stories we put on here. I make new videos seven days a week, and I wouldn't want you to miss a one of them. So if you'd like to support the channel, why not go ahead and subscribe? Maybe hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the great stuff we do here. And of course, if you'd like to support the channel in a more financial way, you could always become a member on YouTube or on Patreon. Spooky Skeletons, that's my $5 members, always get their videos early, as opposed to in the evening. And we've got lots of other cool stuff that you can take advantage of. Just go down to Patreon and give it a look, or become a member on YouTube. 
Speaking of all of our wonderful patrons and YouTube members, let's go ahead and thank them right now. Thanks to Unicorn Hollow, our spooky ghost contributor. Thanks to our spooky skeleton contributors, Janice, Lee Kendall, and Psycat. Thanks to our ghostly reader contributors, Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, and Sarah Samar42. Thanks, guys. We just couldn't do the show without you. Again, if you'd like to support the show in a more monetary fashion, there are links below to Patreon, and you can just go to YouTube and click on Membership, if that's something that interests you. There's also links to my latest book below, if you'd like to go have a look on Amazon. It should show you the other books I've got as well, so why not go ahead and get the whole collection? And, as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.